There are two facts that most of us may or may not know about the Russian Revolution. The first is that there were more people killed in Eisenstein's film about the Bolshevik insurrection than in the insurrection itself, which I think does say something very important. That health and safety in the Russian film industry must be crap. <laughs> the other fact is that it was a disaster. So the Cold War, by definition, was a battle between the evil revolutionary Russia and the good free West. For example, historian Robert Service wrote, Take Brezhnev. Here was a pill-popping, illiterate, vain old man whose decrepit finger could press the button that would trigger a third world war. Good job, then, that our button was controlled by Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> There are some who took the opposite view and claimed that the revolution was a success. For years, Communist Party members were like women with awful boyfriends who refused to believe what everybody says about them. All their mates were screaming, Can't you see? They're starving peasants and invading Hungary! Now, there were a few clues that all wasn't well in Stalinist Russia. First of all, almost everybody who spoke out publicly against the regime ended up in a mental hospital. Now, it is possible that this was just coincidence, and that everybody who said, we are living in a dictatorial and undemocratic state, then followed it up with, and I should know, because I'm a giant wasp. <laughs> but I doubt it. And poetry under the Soviet system was another clue. In the 1930s, the poet Peter Vechora wrote in Pravda, Stalin's greatness is a halo around the constellations and the firmaments around men and factories. How did they review stuff like this? <laughs> Were there journalists on the late show going, well, Vachora has taken an unexpected path here by moving into astronomy. Um, this is certainly a departure from his last work, Oh Stalin, your moustache makes a million thighs go clammy. <laughs> so now everybody agrees that the revolution was a disaster. But this depends on assuming that the Russia of Stalin and the Cold War was the natural consequence of the Bolshevik Revolution. That Lenin and the Bolsheviks on the one hand, and Stalin and his generals on the other, all believed in the same things. Yet there is one piece of evidence which suggests that this might not be true, which is that Stalin had all those from the other group shot. <laughs> this, you might think, indicates a difference of opinion of some significance. Yet almost all modern historians, whether right-wingers like William Rees-Mogg and UN Security Council member Richard Pipes, or ex-Stalinists like Martin Jacques, or even Moscow News itself, blame Lenin and the leaders of the revolution for the atrocities of Stalinism, despite the fact that they were the first ones he killed. Which is like arriving at a crime scene and shouting, There's the murderer there! That dead bloke! <laughs> Stop him before he escapes! <laughs> Hardly anybody treats Lenin now as if he was a serious politician. After all, he never even met the Spice Girls. <laughs> Robert Service argues that one of the reasons that the revolution happened in 1917 was because Lenin knew he was ill, so decided to have it quickly. <laughs> the way you might think, well, I'm 77. If I don't go to the Lake District this year, I might not get another chance. <laughs> So I'm going to try and explain why the revolution happened when it did, and why it could never have happened if Lenin hadn't come across a fireman's uniform and a wig, and why to suggest that Lenin and Stalin believed in the same things is as mistaken analysis of the revolution as the one which concludes that Rasputin was Russia's greatest love machine and that it was a shame how he carried on. <laughs> Pre-revolutionary Russia was the most backward country in Europe. Out of 150 million people who lived there, all but 3 million worked on the land. The royal family, or Tsar and Tsarina, in theory had absolute power, but the current Tsar, Nicholas Romanov, was particularly out of touch. He'd already survived one revolution in 1905, and then in 1912, with another series of mass strikes shaking the country, he was forced to convene a parliament called the Duma. This was one of the biggest events in Tsarist history, but that night he wrote in his diary, April the 14th, took a walk in a thin shirt and took up paddling again. In 1914, on the day he took the decision to dissolve the Duma... July 7th. Very busy morning. A storm came up and it was very muggy. Signed a decree dissolving Parliament. Dined with Olga and Petya. By now the First World War was approaching, but the Tsar wrote... Bathed in the morning. Uncle Vladimir and Shagin lunched with us at the farm. Russia was about to join a world war and it was being run by one of the kids from the famous Five. <laughs> Most real decisions were taken by the Tsarina, his German wife, who would write him instructions telling him how to run the country, like... Tell him you intend to keep Protopopov. Then bring your fist down on the table. Don't yield. Be the boss. Obey your wife. <laughs> Which makes her probably the most effective nagging wife of all time. 
Oi, have you shot those demonstrators yet? <laughs> no, I'll do it after the football. <laughs> You'll do it now! <laughs> the Tsarina appointed Rasputin, who she believed had spiritual powers and could heal her haemophiliac son. And Rasputin was appointed as overseer of every department in the Russian government. Rasputin was like no politician you could imagine today in that he had wild, staring eyes, was officially titled Minister Without Portfolio, <laughs> and believed in the magical qualities of dome-shaped objects. <laughs> but while Rasputin was living it up at court, the peasants were facing ruin. Most of them worked under a scheme whereby they rented land from the landlord who would then pay them for their produce, an amount which was less than the rent. So the more you paid, the more you owed. In other words, these were the bastards who invented the endowment mortgage. <laughs> uh, one third of all land in Russia was owned by a total of 699 landlords. There were 650 different laws restricting the rights of Jews to own land. So wherever possible, peasants flocked into the cities where they could learn a trade and send some of their wages back home. But the state authorities weren't up to adapting the city to deal with these huge numbers. There was no fresh water, no sewage, and one quarter of all babies died before their first birthday. In the months before the revolution, strikes were becoming more widespread. For example, a Bolshevik metal worker called Shliapnikov said, Sometimes a whistle would be enough for the workers to take it as a signal to stop work. But what was making the workforce so militant? Above all, there was one thing, the First World War. Two years into the war, after a succession of military disasters that were largely due to the incompetence of the regime, the Russian army had suffered three million soldiers wounded and two and a half million killed. By 1916, the third year of the war, strikes were spreading throughout Petrograd. Petrograd was the new name of St. Petersburg, which it was decided at the start of the war sounded too German. Now that really is nationalism gone mad, isn't it? To change the name of the capital just to annoy the Germans. <laughs> Even the sun doesn't say, let's call London two world wars and one world cup. <laughs> so who was leading the desertions and the strikes? One common view, remember, is that it was being stirred up by agitators, most importantly Lenin and Trotsky. But if that was true, they were bloody good agitators because Lenin was in Switzerland and Trotsky was in Canada. <laughs> Lenin was the son of a high-ranking Tsarist education official, and his introduction to politics was when he was told that his brother had been executed for plotting to assassinate Tsar Alexander. So you have to have a touch of sympathy for Mr Lenin Sr. He was this Daily Telegraph MCC type, who occasionally must have been in his gentleman's club when one of the other members would have said, Oh, tell me, how are your boys getting along? <laughs> and he'd have had to have said, uh, well, one was executed for plotting to kill the Tsar, and the other one's Lenin. <laughs> As a teenage student, Lenin was attracted to Marxist groups, which were illegal and infiltrated by the secret police. The police did such a good job of this that years later, at one branch meeting of the Bolsheviks, they realised that everybody in the branch was actually a police spy. <laughs> Except for one who was a real member, so they just arrested him and folded the branch up. <laughs> and then there was Trotsky. Now, when Lenin was meticulous, Trotsky was flamboyant. It also been drawn towards the idea that Russia's revolution would have to be led by workers. His problem, though, was that he didn't know any. <laughs> As he explained in his autobiography. I was walking along the street with Grigory Sokolovsky. It's about time we started, I said. We must find workers and set to it. I think we can find them, said Sokolovsky. I used to know one. He's a watchman who belongs to a Bible sect. I think I'll look him up. <laughs> Trotsky was also exiled for revolutionary activities to Siberia, but he feigned an illness to get into hospital and escaped under a bale of hay on a sledge driven by an alcoholic Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> when a revolution broke out in Russia in 1905, Trotsky went straight to Petrograd at the heart of the movement and at the age of 26 made such brilliant speeches that he was elected as leader of the revolution. Which is pretty impressive when I think that when I was 26, most of my political speeches were, no, you're talking crap there, mate. <laughs> the nub of Trotsky's theory was that a Russian revolution led by workers could survive because it would be bound to spark off revolutions in other countries. At the beginning of 1917, Lenin told a meeting of Swiss students that he didn't expect to see a revolution in his lifetime. But then on February the 23rd, International Women's Day, women textile workers in St. Petersburg, many of them the wives of soldiers, went on strike. By the evening, 90,000 people were marching through the streets, demonstrating against the war. 
The next day the protests grew bigger and workers from a mill in the Vyberg district ran into the first regiment of Cossacks brought out to confront the demonstrators. The two sides stood glaring at each other for some time at a decisive moment of the revolution. Would the Cossacks fire? Then, according to a local Bolshevik called Kaorov, one of the Cossacks winked at the workers, which they saw as a signal that the Cossacks wouldn't fire. So the demonstrators stepped under the horses and carried on with their march. Or maybe it was just a camp Cossack who fancied the bloke carrying the banner. <laughs> and they thought, oh, I've done it now, of course, the revolution. <laughs> After five days, the entire city was paralysed. The Tsar was staying in a place called Vyazma and set off back to Petrograd to deal with the revolution. He sent a telegram to the Tsarina. Wonderful weather. Hope you are well and calm. His train arrived at Vichy station, at which point the railroad workers refused to take it any further, telling him that they couldn't carry on because of a faulty bridge. <laughs> the Tsarina was still sending desperate telegrams to the Tsar, advising him on the situation, but the railway workers wrote, not known at this address on the envelope, <laughs> and sent them back. The district court was burnt down, officers were chased from their barracks, and generals began chanting the sentence that they'd repeat for the rest of the year. If only I had one loyal battalion, I could deal with this revolution. But they didn't, and the Tsar was forced to abdicate. So who was going to rule the new Russia? Well, in effect, Russia had two governments. The remnants of the old royal court had cobbled together a collection of businessmen, landlords and politicians from the old Duma to form a provisional government. But the grassroots organisations which had sprung up to lead the five days of revolution were called Soviets, or workers' councils, which ran the city. The story of the rest of 1917 was the story of the conflict between these two bodies, the provisional government and the Soviets. The first question was what to do about the war. Well, the provisional government, which came to be led by Kerensky, was committed to continuing the war, although it did pledge that it would do so only to defend Russia's borders. But the soldiers didn't trust them, and whole divisions were still refusing to fight. In the 7th Army, for example, the Commissar was ordered by the government to disband and court-martial three entire regiments. So the generals were becoming like teachers who can't cope with an unruly class. Wait, stop retreating. A gas attack is a signal for me. It is not a signal for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, Russia's revolutionaries were returning from exile. On the 3rd of April, Lenin arrived back in Russia at the Finland station. The leaders of the Soviet met him and presented him with a bunch of flowers. But Lenin went berserk at the Soviet leaders for not taking power from the provisional government. The slogan of the Bolsheviks, he said, must be... Bread, peace and land. All power to the Soviets. The government responded by going on to the offensive. They raided the Bolshevik press, brought back the death penalty for deserters and arrested Lenin and Trotsky. The Tsarist generals were watching this and they became convinced that the time was right to stage a coup and set up a military regime. So General Kornilov, with one of the last loyal regiments, got in position outside Petrograd. As this coup unfolded, it became clear the only people who could defend the provisional government against the generals were the Soviets, the very people Kerensky had been arresting. The Soviets organised sailors and railway workers to refuse to carry Kornilov's troops. So, the coup probably ended up with loads of soldiers stood on a platform going, typical, where's the 839 to Petrograd? <laughs> <laughs> if they wanted a coup, they should never have sold the line to Richard Branson. <laughs> the coup had failed, but the power of the provisional government had been fatally undermined. Throughout Russia, peasants looted their landlord's estates. A peasant called Gapanenko from the Tauroid province said, We raided the building, drove out the overseers, took the work animals, the machinery and the grain. Then we took the blinds from the windows, the doors from the frames, and the floors from the rooms. Then we took the zinc from the roof. I bet the insurance companies weren't so cocky that year. <laughs> Had another raid on your animals, grain, roof, doors, floorboards, and your estate, and your zinc? Then you need diddly 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 dee. <laughs> Trotsky had persuaded soldiers stationed in the capital to refuse to buy tickets for public transport. Though he was lucky Petrograd's railways didn't employ them blokes with the yellow hats on Connex South Central. Because <laughs> then they'd have just gone, oh, you can point that rifle at my head as much as you like, mate, there's a ten-pound standard fine. <laughs> If that happened again now, the soldiers would have a natty slogan as well. Get a criminal record, not a ticket. <laughs> cab drivers refused to give ministers a lift to their meetings, though if they'd been really militant, they'd have just behaved like normal cab drivers, said they were going to take them and not turned up. <laughs> Lenin was still under arrest, but rather than turn up in court, he decided to escape 
So he got someone to fetch him the uniform of a Finnish railway fireman and a wig, and in disguise he took a train to Helsinki, where he was hidden by a police chief, who'd been a fan of Lenin's years before. At this moment, while disguised as a fireman, Lenin sensed that the moment to act had come. So he got word to the other Bolshevik leaders to hold a meeting to decide on a date for the insurrection. But the first problem was finding somewhere secret to hold it. This is where the liberal diarist Sukhanov came in. Sukhanov hated the Bolsheviks, but he became the biggest loser in history. Because not only were his enemies becoming the dominant party, but one of the people who joined them was his wife. And she told Lenin that she could clear the old man out of the house for a few hours so they could have their meeting round there. <laughs> so while Sukhanov was out doing errands, Lenin, still dressed as a fireman, and the other Bolshevik leaders had a meeting in his kitchen to plan the revolution, <laughs> with Mrs. Sukhanov running in and out with tea and biscuits. <laughs> so how did that little episode affect their marriage? Did they end up at a marriage guidance? So when did you start to distrust her? Well, I think it was when she sent me up the garden centre, invited the Bolshevik Central Committee round, <laughs> and set a date for the Russian Revolution. Really? Mm -hmm. And how did that make you feel? <laughs> At the meeting was the Central Committee of the Bolsheviks, including Lenin, still in disguise, Trotsky who joined them a few weeks earlier, and Stalin, who at that point was thought of as nothing more than a reliable workhorse. The insurrection was set for the night of October the 25th, 1917, a date Lenin worked out at the meeting on a piece of squared paper in an exercise book, which means that at some point in history there was a sheet of paper with a drawing of a cube and a squiggle round the edge, and take power on 25th of October with the O's and R's of October coloured in. <laughs> Railway and telegraph system workers came over to the Bolsheviks, and Trotsky was elected as president of the Petrograd Soviet. A Bolshevik metal worker from Weiberg stole the keys to the city's drawbridges and the provisional government's last loyal force, the Bicycle Regiment, deserted. <laughs> but even so, how could you take a Bicycle Regiment seriously? <laughs> what sort of training do they have? OK, men, and fairy liquid on the inner tube. Two, three, look for the bubble. Two, three, apply the backs. Two, three. <laughs> Bolshevik troops were placed at the entrance to the Winter Palace and refused to allow members of the government to pass. According to the journalist John Reed, a crowd said, We insist on passing. We are unarmed. But the sailor in charge of the troops said, I have orders. Hmm. What will you do if we go forward? Will you shoot? No, I won't shoot people who have no guns. Right, you will go forward. What can you do? So another soldier came up and yelled, We'll spank you. Now go home and leave us in peace. <laughs> And the crowd turned around and marched back up Nevsky Prospect. But see, this wouldn't work in an English revolution, because if you told someone from the English ruling class you were going to spank them, they... <laughs> well, you're ahead of me, Croydon. <laughs> They'd say, well, I should hope you will. I've been a very naughty capitalist. <laughs> Red Guards now occupied all the key points which had previously been in the government's hands. But the provisional government now had so few supporters that all the Bolsheviks had to capture was the Winter Palace itself, which they did by sending a gunboat up the River Neva, which fired two blanks, at which point Kerensky surrendered and escaped from the building. The Soviets, under the rule of the Bolsheviks, became the new government. Private ownership of land was abolished and became the property of peasant Soviets. Inheritance was abolished, divorce was made legal, and the empire's nationalities were given the right to break from Russia. All literate citizens were mobilised to teach the illiterate to read, and homework and tests were abolished in schools. In other words, before they made any decisions on policy, they rang up Michael Howard, said, what do you reckon on this, and then did the opposite. <laughs> New banknotes were printed with proletarians of the world uniting eight languages on them, which must have been a nightmare for forgers. <laughs> yeah, what's proletarian in Turkish? <laughs> for the first few days, life was as you'd imagine it after a revolution, with the new regime saying, we're the new government, and loads of people going, no, you're not, and taking no notice. So Trotsky, who was now the new foreign secretary, turned up at his office, and the civil servants refused to let him in. So he had to go and get a locksmith to break the lock. Whereas now, if you saw a foreign secretary peering through a keyhole shouting, let me in, you'd just think, well, at least that's one woman who's turned him down. <laughs> then there was the problem of wine. A crowd of the poor broke into the Winter Palace and raided wine cellars, and then the cellars throughout the city. So the Bolsheviks specially picked a group of guards to stop this happening, as it was turning the revolution into a drunken debacle. 
But the next day, when a commander was asked to report on this, he said, I'm uh, afraid the uh, Prio Brzezinski regiment sent to guard the cellars got totally drunk. <laughs> so they sent another regiment to deal with the first regiment, but the next day the commander said, The guards sent to deal with the Prio Brzezinski regiment uh, all got utterly drunk. <laughs> Uh, so we dispatched armoured cars to disperse the drunken crowd, but after patrolling up and down a few times, they began to weave suspiciously. <laughs> so we tried flooding the cellars with water, but the firemen sent to do the job got completely drunk instead. <laughs> The revolution was a cauldron of enthusiasm. The Soviets were forums of great debates on every issue. In one of the most anti-Semitic countries in the world, Trotsky, a Jew, had been elected leader of the Soviet. Despite the illiteracy, masses of workers started going to the opera. There were cases of monks evicting their bishops and collectivising the monastery. The land and property of Russia officially belonged to the Russian people. John Reed described a journey on a truck in the week of the revolution. The old workman who drove held the wheel in one hand, while with the other... He swept the far gleaming capital in an exultant gesture. Mine, he cried, his face all alight. All mine now. My Petrograd. So how did Russia go from this high point to being a tyrannical dump full of starving peasants, poems about constellations and where you couldn't even get a pair of jeans? <laughs> After the new government negotiated its way out of the First World War, Russia was invaded by 14 armies, including the British, Americans, Japanese and Germans, intent on restoring a regime similar to Tsarism. These foreign armies set up and backed counter-revolutionary Russian armies known as the Whites. A typical white general was Kornilov, who said, We must save Russia, even if we have to set fire to half of it and shed the blood of three quarters of Russians. Trotsky was given the job of building from scratch a new Red Army to save the revolution. And there's no doubt that during this period, Trotsky, the Red Army and the secret police, known as the Cheka, were ruthless. But modern historians who mention this ruthlessness without putting it in the context of the Civil War are as daft as someone who says, Oh, you know, in 1946 there was an awful lot of building work going on in the Hiroshima area, <laughs> without mentioning the bomb. <laughs> The British, who'd sent an army to Murmansk, seemed not much less crazy. The British government sent a note to their commander in Russia advising him to blow up the Baltic fleet, but don't antagonise the Bolshevik government. <laughs> and Britain's spy in Russia, Riley, was seriously working on a plan to capture Lenin and Trotsky and make them walk through the streets of Moscow with no trousers and pants. <laughs> By 1920, the White Armies were defeated, but at what cost? Russia, already one of the most backward countries of the world, had been through seven years of devastation. In short, Russia was on the edge of economic collapse. The Soviets had also collapsed, and Russia was now ruled by the Bolshevik Party alone. Lenin had been sick ever since being shot in 1918 by an anti-Bolshevik terrorist, Fanny Kaplan, and in May 1922, he suffered a stroke. Paralysed, unable to speak or write, Lenin continued to work, but was clearly dying. And this is the point where so many people assume that Stalin took over where Lenin left off. But in his final months, Lenin came to dislike Stalin. The reason why they fell out, first of all, was brilliant. Stalin was rude to Lenin's wife. <laughs> well, now Lenin is usually portrayed in films like Nicholas and Alexandra as this stern, emotionless figure whose home life would be to say to his wife things like, Can you pass the marmalade, comrade? <laughs> when in fact he was down the pub going, I'll tell you what, Trotsky, a man could disagree with me about imperialism, I'll still drink with a man. But if he's out of order with a missus, I won't have it. <laughs> Lenin began to distrust Stalin over lots of issues, particularly his patronising attitude to the nationalities outside Russia, which made up the USSR. At Christmas 1922, he dictated a statement. I suggest the comrades remove Comrade Stalin from the post of General Secretary and appoint in his place a man who in all respects differs from him. As Lenin lay dying, an argument broke out between Stalin and Trotsky. Stalin put forward a theory called socialism in one country. We can have socialism in one country if we ignore the international situation. To which Trotsky replied... We can walk naked through the streets of Moscow in January if we ignore the weather and the police. <laughs> Trotsky was the orator, the wit, the theoretician, the military leader. So how could he lose to Stalin? 
For Trotsky, everything depended on the revolution spreading. He'd been right about the Russian Revolution sparking a series of others, but one by one in Germany, Hungary, Bulgaria, China and Italy, they'd been put down. For Stalin, on the other hand, every defeat of the socialist movement internationally strengthened his hand. And then in January 1924, Lenin died. Stalin set the tone that was to follow by arranging for the telegram informing Trotsky of Lenin's death to be sent late so that Trotsky missed the funeral. For the next four years there followed a series of internal political rows and it was at this point that Russia under Stalin lost all resemblance to the Russia of the revolution brought about by Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Where Lenin had promised the peasants land, Stalin had a hundred million of them herded into state farms and ten million starved to death as a result. Millions more were forced into the cities. Where Lenin had insisted that the Union should remain independent, Stalin made strikes illegal and workers were given no choices as to where to work. Where Lenin insisted on debate, Stalin had any opposition is put in a labour camp. All potential opposition had to be destroyed, including almost all the old Bolshevik leaders. It was as if Russia was suddenly being run by a sadistic, spoiled eight-year-old in a playground. I confess to crimes against the state, plotting to blow up the Kremlin, and I smell. <laughs> Whereas Lenin had insisted on the Soviets being democratic, Stalin was the opposite. So in one election to local Soviets in 1947, he came top with 2,122 votes. Then it was discovered that the constituency only had 1,617 votes. <laughs> so the next day, Pravda reported... The extra ballot papers were put into urns by citizens of neighbouring constituencies anxious to express their gratitude. <laughs> so to conclude, to blame the crimes of Stalin on the millions of people who fought, learnt to read, spoke at congresses, watched opera, winked at demonstrators, sent back telegrams, stole keys to drawbridges and died for a different sort of society, to blame the crimes of Stalin on these people is as daft as blaming John Logie Baird for Noel's house party. <laughs> And so, finally, what would Lenin have said if he'd met the Spice Girls? Well, I reckon he'd have sent them round to Trotsky and said, you're more up his street than mine, really. <laughs> Whereas Stalin would have tried to trump them with his own Politburo girls, whose first single would have been, if you want to be my lover, you've got to have my consent, and raise tractor production by 22%, <laughs> paint children in cornfields, smiling and content, then you can put your halo on my firmament. 